All right, episode 100 here. We are pleased to be joined by a couple hockey fathers, a couple legends, uh, Dan Whitney, father of uh, Ryan and Sean, and Buddy Yandel, father of I mean, Brian, more or less. Yeah. I don't know about the other guy, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, and don't forget and don't forget Lauren and obviously Colin. and Colin, uh, the best, best witness. So. Uh, welcome, guys. We are uh, pleased to have you here, that's for sure. Uh, it's Thanks great for having us. us. Yeah, this is great. Episode 100, we wanted to make it special. and A couple guys, legends. Yeah, legends. Well, legends they blew us off for, for 99 others, more or less. Yeah, <laughs> right? We had to nail, nail them down, talk to the secretaries, and, and, oh. and get them out. Uh, in the fold there, but no, thanks again for joining us. This is great. I thought we were going out about a lot of this. That's true. Yeah. There you go. That's yeah. true. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Well, let's talk yeah. about, um, you know, there obviously you go. we'll go one at a time here, but, you know, Dan, we'll start with you. When did you, you know, fall in love with the game of hockey, uh, getting involved in it and growing up in Winchester, Massachusetts? The mean streets of Winchester. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it was um, really the or era, you know, my parents would go bring us to games, my dad, and, uh, Hockey exploded in Boston, and to see a player like that, we've been so fortunate with the athletes we've had here, and um, it was, and they're building rinks like mad. So they actually built one in Winchester, which is now a condominium project. <laughs> <laughs> but it goes back to that. Yeah, they they really the MDC rinks really blew up uh, back back in that time, and the participation around the city and the buzz with the Big Bad Bruins. Bruins that's uh, one of the the biggest booms in you know the hockey around here and I think that's the fabric that we see today you know there's a blue collar work ethic that they brought to the, the rank and you know it's the participation from the youth around the area is really one of the, the, the big things that uh, Bobby did for the game. Really the league you know I mean it, it exploded then when they went from 16 to 12 in one season right it was great great hockey. How about you dad? Um, Probably at yeah, about nine or ten year olds before the MDC era. Uh, kids from Charlestown had to go down to Revere, and maybe the founder of hockey in Charlestown was a legend named Father Smith. And every Sunday, the Charlestown youth would go down there and play games. And my two older brothers played, and I used to follow them. And one day they didn't have a goalie, and I volunteered in my boots. <laughs> I didn't even have skates on them. Just fell in love with the game there and followed my older brothers around for quite a bit. Um, but then, like you said, eventually the MDC rink star opened. I think they didn't open until like my, well, I hit high school. I can remember we practiced uh, from all the Catholic points in the Lynn Arena before school. So you had to love the game to give that sacrifice, you know. Yeah, I mean, were there some uh, muffled, like, sniffles playing with the older brothers? So if you cried, you, you couldn't play anymore? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah just after right they, into the mitten. That's it. They beat me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm not so sure if Buddy didn't make them cry. <laughs> <laughs> that's a while, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, talk about. I mean, like you said, the sacrifices that your parents made, because obviously, you know, hockey was an expensive sport even back then, right? But you know, just to even get involved in it, a lot of people, especially in your era, and you know, the '60s, '70s, growing up in Boston, I mean. You, you know, your parents, firefighters, single, you know, parents didn't have cars, you just, you know, commuted, but the sacrifices that your parents had to make to get you guys involved in the game. Oh, yeah, it was a big sacrifice. And uh, my father, again, being a fireman, there were a lot of times he worked nights. Uh, they're not like they are now with the 24 hour shifts. They were two days on, days, and a day off, and then two nights. And a lot of times I had to find a way to get around myself. Uh, my father would arrange something nice for me. But uh, Charleston was a very close knit community. We had a lot of friends that were always willing to take kids. Um, again, it seemed like it was only Revere or the Lynn Arena, I mean, right. two of the closest venues to where we lived. And back then, my brother Paul, he played, uh, he was a really play, good player. I wasn't. And uh, <laughs> they used to play double headers, they played two games at one time. Remember that in Lynn Arena, so they'd have a period where like Malden would play Everett, and then Winchester would play Marrows. Then they'd clean the ice. So there were literally two games going at once, and at last we'd be there the whole day, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was crazy, and it was, but it was, it was a blast, you know. You go down there and watch two double headers, so you'd be watching four games. It was incredible. 
That's, I've never heard that. Yeah. Imagine the crazy hockey parents these days having to overlap different games oh. and all that type of stuff. You, <laughs> they could do it. In yeah. the bros. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Absolutely. There'd be rumbles. Well, the Sydney League did that also. Yeah. Charlestown, South East, all those teams. And yeah, my brothers. But conveniently, it was a bar room at the corner because they played at the old Northeastern's you know, Boston Arena, as yeah. they called it back then. And, uh, the yeah, there were a lot of fights. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name of that? Because some parents wouldn't watch the other game. They had it timed perfectly. They'd leave because the arena did the same thing as Lynn Arena. Boston Arena did the same thing. They'd yeah. have the double headers. So one parent's like, let's say, you know, they'd watch their sons play. Then they'd run, they'd time it perfectly. The power, they got the game, and then they got the ice cleaning. So we'll get back to the other game. And then they'd do it between each period. So it's pretty good. Pretty good yeah, setup that way. Yeah, good setup for the parents. <laughs> oh, that's great. Besides the, uh, the, the, like, you know, the Bobby Oars of the world and the people you watched on TV, what was it, you know, were there guys that you guys grew up idolizing, like younger players before you guys? Oh, sure. Yeah. I, I grew up the guys like Paul Hurley from Melrose, Paul Bashot Hurley, as they call him, um, Stevie Dollar from Melrose, uh, Robbie Fatorik, who I had the fortunate, or uh, unfortunate, <laughs> Uh, played against him in the state championship, well, in the Eastern Mass Championship one time. He beat us like eight to two. <laughs> he, had, about, he, he was in on every goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he was. Six and two. I got my picture on the front base with blows on my knees. <laughs> with the minus. <laughs> Dash. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't keep the plus minus back then, though, I'm sure. <laughs> no, they didn't. No. But we knew Fatorik was in, like you said. But, yeah, I think the Dijon had like six goals and Fatorik had six assists. Yeah. yeah. But he was one of the best uh, people. People like Kid Hampy from Dedham. Uh, oh, yeah. A lot of great players. I remember Paul Hurley, the shot. All the shot? At Melrose, right? Melrose yes. High School. Yeah. yeah. And there were some good players out of there. But it was back then, you know, in our era, the, the public high school teams were the teams, you know, feeding the Division One and okay. Three and Two. You know, you'd come out of Melrose at Dedham and EMI and go right to Division One. You know, there wasn't a prep school, junior hockey, you know, aspect. That hasn't happened in a while. Yeah. yeah. It was it's Sean, changed. was Sean Collins when the last one was yeah. direct, went from D1 to college. There aren't too many. Yeah, Sean you Collins, did, right? Man. You did, Sean's age. Yeah. But those he guys, did, public, public high school, public, public high, high school, school guys. Four yeah. years of high school. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sean Collins, Nettie Haver, and and Mike Matt. Souza, Blake Dolce. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you don't see it too yeah. often now. Nettie went from Arlington right to BC. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 And speaking of BC, can you talk about your time playing at BC with some uh, some pretty good players? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Joey Mullen was probably the the best player there, but we had a lot of good players. You know, God rest his soul, a kid named Richie Hart who just died this year. Uh, Paul Skidmore, a goaltender. Ned Yetten, a great goaltender. Um, Played with Barma. Mark Riley. <laughs> Tommy Sonny. Yeah. Probably the, the better of all, so all of us was a kid named Bobby Ferret, who unfortunately yeah. died way too young. But situate guy. He went to there, right? Yeah. yeah. He was sure. a great player. Great player. He had a good score. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. he could score. Yeah. But uh, yeah, actually, our freshman year, Bubba and I were only two freshmen that made him in the class. And we ended up roommates on the road quite a bit. Which was, which His hands were like legs. They were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why they were so strong. Unfortunately, his legs were like hands. <laughs> <laughs> I think he got drafted by the Canadians. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that. Uh, yeah. He did. I, he, he just he didn't like a lot. But a great, really a great kid, great family. Yeah. Okay, now, uh, did Cita come back and coach you? His first Cita was the assistant coach. I was originally drafted by Schnooks and went to prep school at New Prep for a year. And then uh, Sublaski came on. And uh, five of our starting six players from uh, New Prep went to BC. Wow. And the goaltender. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Not tight there. recruiting budget. Yeah, yeah. just yeah. dropped down the street. My defensive partner, a little bit Merrimack, a kid named Bobby Bowling. Yeah. He was a really nice guy. Yeah, he's he's good son was a good player. That's my excuse for not playing high school hockey, because I was at New Prep. It was one of the 
the deadbeats who had to go there for high school. Well, Big Dan, you went up to uh, Holy Cross. It was a great uh, August 29th, 1976. There you go. And, uh, He's got that tattoo yeah, on, his, on my foot so I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, my hockey uh, experience lasted. I, I played uh, JV. I was told I was going to dress one day. My coach was Mike Odessa, who just passed away. He did. Um, and uh, that was uh, so I quit basically to uh, do what? I don't know, basically, Pond Budweiser's. And uh, <laughs> He said, I had my equipment, he said, tell Whitney to get his equipment back, because if he doesn't, I'm going to run him over, back up, and run him over again. <laughs> so, uh, I had a lot of friends who played there, all kids like uh, Kevin O'Quinn, um, he's a really good good player uh, from Arlington, uh, Peter Ansulli from Falmouth, they were like a D2, they played D2, and they were doing, they were starting to do really well. I mean, Dessa went on to win a national championship, had a little problem up there at the RPI. Yeah. Uh, everyone's Thanks, pretty Adam familiar Oates. with that, yeah. And Adam Oates, and uh, I think he has Joey Gino yeah. too yeah. out there. And Graham um, Thompson, right? I mean, yeah, they, they Graham were... Thompson is the reason he wasn't there after a while. Right. So. Right. <laughs> but um, Bobby Farrelly, red, red, red light. He was <laughs> right. like the third string goalie. Red was light, really? yeah. So Rhode Island, Island? the family. Yes, yeah. yeah. Good goaltenders too, and uh, so they were. They were. You know, I went to all the games, and I was good friends with everyone. But I, you know, for those kids up there, I wish. I hadn't quit, you know. I should have. I should have played it out, right. and uh, I, I, I always regretted that. So, well, you always chased that college hockey dream because I remember if we fast forward years down the road, I think we were fifteen. You know, we were staying. It was a select tournament, and um, you know, the, the the couple parents were able to go out, but most of we you lived in the dorms, right? When when you went out there. And, Remember the legendary story? You joined in like a broom ball game. At the oh, that was in, in that was in Michigan. Yeah. yeah, that was when Ryan had the. Uh, yeah, so we were like it was like select 15s or something like that. It right? was it was actually a tryout for the national development team when they were, they came in. Oh, and, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. and yeah. I was out there, and that uh, you know it's like two o'clock in the morning, couldn't sleep, went out for a ride. It was like literally midnight, and uh, there were these kids, and they were playing broom ball like side to side on the ice. There were like three games going on. So I looked, and they were missing a player. And I said, "Hey, <laughs> you want me to play?" And I got into the game. Like, who is this goofy? And bastard? it was so funny because I went out there in the boots, first thing, horizontal, boom, down my <laughs> tailbone, head slashed off. They're looking at me like, "But I put one off the wall." Did you? Did put you one s- off the wall? Got a nice goal. Did you sign the waiver, old man? Yeah, no, but uh, it was fun. We ended up playing for like an hour and a half, and uh, then they asked, and I was. I was smarter then. They said, you want to go back to the frat house? I go, no, I don't think I can go back to the frat house. <laughs> Frank the Tank. But, uh, we won. <laughs> Just for the record, we did win the game. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all you used the wall, though, team game. I was using the wall, team game, head up. Communicating. Communicating. <laughs> yeah, you must have been talking like crazy. Oh, yeah. Oh, talking uh, orders out there. Well, uh, getting into that, uh, the coaching, I know you have you know a bunch of stuff uh, that he still applies today as a coach, but were there any, you know, Influences that you guys had, you know, to kind of, uh, you know, create your coaching style, you, you know, using personal experience, but also anyone that you guys got coached by. Buddy that, Yandel. <laughs> got I didn't get coached by him, but seriously, I, you know, I thought I knew hockey until I met Buddy. Right. And, and I was always just a fan of the game. I wanted to see how coaches coach, like Scotty Bowman, and how did they build teams, you know, and, and what made them great teams. And, but Buddy is an amazing coach. An amazing coach you guys was at. And um, I wasn't on the bench uh, because they wouldn't let me with uh, the 83 Kings, but with Sean's team and the 89 Kings, Peter Arnold, he played at Boston College, and Danny Shakespeare played at Colgate. And pretty good organization. Sent a lot of kids to D1. Pro Jimmy Hayes was on that team. Sure. You know, Sean played at Cornell. Derek Pallas played at Princeton. Uh, Mike Holman was at uh, Babson. Uh, with just a bunch of kids who played. Uh, every kid on that team played college sports. One played football at Endicott, and one played golf. I forget where. I was just doing this. But every single kid in that team. And that's what you want, there, right? You know, just to keep playing. Don't be a coach's last coach. And I don't want to say anything about the bit, but the, I, I played for a coach who was the last coach of a lot of guys. Mm-hmm. A lot of guys. So you never want to be that. And But he just, uh, he knew the game so well. You know, just a, just a brilliant in the basics, just the little things. You know, I had a thing I talked about: kiss, keep it simple, solid, and smart. I hate the negative one, the right. two S's. You know, keep right. it simple, solid, and smart, and and communicate. Like we were talking about communication. Like we, if we did, if we were practicing, and they weren't talking in the drills, I'd stop and skate. We'd, we'd stop and skate them. Mm-hmm. 
And I'm not a big fan of sprints because when do you see kids skate 200 feet with the puck? And it doesn't happen too often. So we ended, and it was funny, I saw him do it. We ended every practice with side-to-side three-on-three games, triangulation, passing angles, working on all that little stuff. So I'd have to say literally the guy that I learned the most from coaching and, and uh, was an inspiration to me was Brian Smith. But it's great stuff. Yeah. How about you, Dad? I mean, I guess, uh, where, where did you learn this stuff? Because your father didn't grow up playing hockey and... and... No, no, I, my father played all other sports. Um, <laughs> had a really good high school coach, a guy named uh, Fred Johnson, who unfortunately only stayed for three years. My senior year, he left and went to teach up at Swansea High School. He, he was very good. He was very influential. We had great practices. Uh, and we had a lot of uh, different kind of talent, a lot of you know, egotistical kids on our team, and he knew how to handle them all, you know, I, you know put everyone in its place, and uh, I think I just, I can remember one time going up to Lake Placid, it had to be with you, and your mother bought me a book of like 400 drills, and I just like studied it, and I implemented it into my coaching, and I, I always try never to make practice boring. You know, right. try to have fun. You know, my, my motto was that they're coming off the ice with a smile on their face and sweat coming down the helmet. Well, my my goal is accomplished. Yeah. yeah, a lot of a lot of good drills, skills, and developing the kids' skills. And then when I went to high school, with you know, I I really rationed out my time. I, I mean, ice time is so valuable. You some of the hours are only fifty minutes, some are hour an hour. And uh, I was fortunate at Randall High. We, you know, the rink was kind of open to us, so our varsity always packs an hour and a half or so every day, and, I, and the JV's are gone for an hour, but. I had every minute of it planned out, you know, skating, breakouts, splitting up. Kids never stood still. I, I couldn't stay in that. The kids stand still watching a power play, you know, they were playing on, you know. Mm-hmm. But on the other end, take shots, learn how to, you know, make passes and do stuff like that. Um, I actually wrote this down. I was thinking about the 83 Kings practices, and this is what Buddy, this is how Buddy had the practice. Struck, discuss, you know, perfect, discuss practice before you yeah. go in the locker room. Plans and goals uh, before being on the ice. And then we give you pucks at the beginning, remember? Five minutes, just do what you want with it. Skate yeah. around to create creativity. Then they blow the whistle. Uh, skate entire team, um, like about 10 minutes. Uh, and then uh, D drills at one end with breakouts, et cetera. Then the offense would go down the other end, same thing. Uh, then drills for the entire team together, you know, two on ones, three on twos, et cetera, 15, 20 minutes and finish with east-west, one zone, three on threes, 45 second shifts, whistle, two nets, focus on using the wall, spacing, triangulation, passing, quick release, players playing the game. Sprints, never start. Kids will work harder when they're playing the game. Uh, and that, those were buddies' practices. And I we used those in the 89 games. I finally talked to those guys. We were doing sprints at the end of every practice. Like we oh, every, <laughs> no, it's, like, yeah. it's not effective because the kids are like dogging it. They're doing the fake, yeah, the yeah, fake yeah, hustle. The, yeah, the, hustle. the arms are moving, the legs are moving, then they're going nowhere. Yeah. But uh, you, once you, you put a puck, that, didn't it? Yeah. Once you Still put doing a, it. once you put a puck in front of them, and 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 the game and playing the team, you know, together everyone accomplishes more. You've heard me say it a million times, and and doing that, and that's what Buddy did, you know. And and uh, another thing. Buddy just quote up was fun. Let's make it fun. And if you're moving, like I go to a rink sometimes now still, and I'll see one coach can, instructing one kid and 17 kids are leaning against the boards. It's it's horrifying. Like talk about you don't have enough ice time, you know. Right. And um, I mean, we haven't always agreed with everything that like USA Hockey and stuff like that has has done or tried to put out there. But I think a big thing of it now is you know. More coaches on the ice, small area games, stations, practices, getting kids reps, like you said. Right. If kids are standing around, standing still, there's 15 guys on the ice, 16 guys on the ice. There's nothing worse. There's nothing worse than when I walk into a rink now. And, you know, I'm still learning it too, right? But I've been, you know, coaching it now for 15, 16 years. And just when I see kids taking a knee and not moving at eight, nine years old, it, it it's it's painful. Stations are the key. You're right. It's it's, it's so important. You know, they can oh, yeah, never stop. They don't, so they can't be punching each other in the head. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that was the biggest thing. I mean, I learned it quick when I was running. You know, youth hockey, like like learn escape programs. Like if they're standing around, all it's going to lead to is the parents complaining because little you know 
little Johnny punched little Danny in the head while they were standing still in line and yada, yada, yada. Like, it just creates more more madness for, for, for you as a coach right. or the program direct, director to have to deal with. That's where you taught so many kids to slew foot when you <laughs> <laughs> We learned many tricks of the yeah, trades from, time uh, from Big Bud. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Stuff but, that nowadays would be put in prison for. <laughs> but, but that's great to, to hear. I mean, you're really ahead of your time with some of the drills and the concepts, but like that practice plan to keep things moving and, and be organized is so important. You know, for example, in, in high school, I had a very good coach, ran good practices. Jack Foley was oh, great practices. ahead of his time yeah. with some of the skill development and the approach, um, you know, a lot of Europe, European influence, you know, regrouping, and then you just having game, like a game plan in every single zone. And that was like very important for me. It kind of opened my eyes to, you know, being able to know that there's more out there than just individual trying to beat someone you use your teammates and if it's structured correctly you can be really successful so like all the, the players that came through if they turn their brain on a little bit as well as you know developing their skills they're going to be that much better so that's great to hear right. being ahead of the, the curve a little bit well i, I saw bit. buddy do a, do a, pra- a drill and you know it ended up ryan got to the nhl with that drill and that was just turning the net and hitting the breakout yeah. the breakout and it would be defensive and like He'd do it over and over and over. And repetition is what's going to get it. Yeah. You know? Jack, of course, he, he ran great practices. Yeah. And it was, it was just valuable. like that flow. Yeah. You know? That's really good. I think a lot of that concept, too, when I did coach with uh, Jack Foley, kind of the Ham League, and we did a lot of those international ice hockey academies. Yep. And a lot of those drills came from Finland. Yeah. You know, a lot of those small games, a lot of those corner drills, you know, I mean, look at the Finns that play in the National Hockey yeah. League. They, they've just got an incredible amount of talent, oh. vision, passing abilities, <laughs> that side of the puck. stuff like that. You know? Right. And I, I really enjoyed watching, you know, working with Jack. Uh, yeah. He was a great guy. Yeah. So great. And uh, Kevin Sullivan was his assistant when I was there. He was really like a real hockey intellect and would travel to Russia. He loved it. Yeah, Finland, Sweden. So he was just g- gathering information on some of those, you know, processes that they, you know, it's completely different than the U.S. The U.S. has tried to, you know, kind of flip the script on more practice time, and but that's what they grew up with, with good drills and skill development and developing the brain too. But uh, yeah, I was exposed to that through those two guys, and it was, you know, kind of paid dividends for a lot of the guys on our team. Well, it's funny how the the, the game has evolved. You know, the North American style of North South, attack the net, and then well, I can remember when the Russians were oh. coming over here, and I, and I met the guard and watching them play the Bruins, and they come up there to me like four straight drop passes in the wall. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> what are they doing? It wasn't allowed, really. Yeah, yeah, that wasn't allowed. Yeah. 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 Like, oh, you're just scratching the air, like, how do they know it's all North South hockey? Yeah. I, I remember literally watching it was in black and white. 1972 Summit Series, and I, I was a hockey freak, so I found those games, and it was, we were down the Cape, and uh, so it was the NHL All-Star team, and, uh, basically, except Hull couldn't play because he played in the WHA, so the NHL wouldn't let him play, and they, they missed a couple, or couldn't play because he was injured. That was a yeah. shame, uh, but what hockey that was, and they came out, and they had the goofy Joe for helmets on, CCP, red sticks, the Titan sticks, I was like, oh, we're going to kill these guys. U.S. goes up 2 nothing. And uh, I remember it was uh, the KL line, and uh, they made a pass backwards, like from the blue line back to regroup. And I was laughing. I remember being a little kid, like, look, they passed backwards, like because they had the soccer in a, in a, oh, into yeah, the right, game. Right. And they were passing it backwards, and I'm like, oh, that's so silly, that's so silly. They passed it back, went D to D. Meanwhile, Kalamoff, who died in a uh, accident, but was a, an unbelievable player, and Bobby Clark broke his ankle on purpose in that <laughs> oh, series, yeah. on purpose. Uh, two hands, right? Two hands. Uh, Two-hander broke his ankle. Couldn't play anymore after that. But he came back between the defensemen. He got hit with a pass right up the middle. He walked through Pat's Whitey Stapleton and Bill White, two NHL All-Star defensemen, went down, put a move on Dryden. It was two to one. The final score of that game was seven three. The Russians won. Wow. And I saw. I remember literally, you know. So that was seventy-two. I was fifteen years old, and I said, "That is." I remember thinking, "Like that is the future of hockey," and wow. it's such a it's it's such a better game than the game we grew up in. You know, the guys who coach you, like, dump and chase, dump and chase. Stay one guy high. You know, n- north-south, north-south. There was no east-west game when we were growing up. Very rare, you know. All brought east-west into hockey. Right. But 
that was by himself, you know. I was just on his own skate. Yeah. Right, but. When he gets sick and tired of going about the south. Right, but to, <laughs> to see that Travis. game, and, 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 to, and you know I'm a soccer fan, it's a beautiful game, so. But to see that game played like that, it was really special. And I knew it. I knew it right then, sitting on my buddy's couch in Fallon that day. So I'll never forget it. Amazing. Can you guys talk about, obviously, you know, Coach, the um, 83 Kings growing up with Mark McConnell, but then the 86 Kings with Keith, and, and you said the, uh, the 89 with Trumbo. What was your guys' like take on, you know, whether it's, um, you know, I guess the question is, like, how many guys did you guys move per year on the team? You know what I mean? Because this is a question that, that we get a lot in terms of, you know, I know you guys aren't the guys that were out there trying to cut people left and right, but, you know, you see some of these teams like every year it's a massive overhaul and there's not developing your own players. Like what was your guys' take on on, on that stuff? Well, we seem to make maybe two moves every year from when you started with the Kings, with yeah. Mr. Grail and Mr. O'Connor. Um, and it always strengthened our teams because, you know, remember I used to call it much, much new played it was the Metro League. That's right, yeah. I call it the Metro mating season where <laughs> everyone's trying to jump, you know, and uh, we got some really good character people in our organization, you know, people like Chris Roday. Yep. Um, Franklin Sports, shout yeah, out sponsor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and the, who's of, the other kid from Lynn? Uh, John Barry. Johnny Brendan Barry, came in. Brendan Byrne. You know, we, we made subtle changes and, uh, it really improved that team. And one of the things about that too, we had the greatest group of parents on the face of the earth. I mean, really did with Dan and uh, Joey Rando for a while. And, uh, you know, Mike Morris, big Mike Morris. And, yeah. You know, just good, good people. You know, a lot of fun to be with, uh, a lot of traveling. And we could get into some of those stories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. the travel they do now compared to what we did is, yeah. but, but, uh, you know, we go to, Canada once a year. You guys are going to Florida and Nashville. Yeah, yeah. Oh. It's just, it's crazy. Yeah. We well, I always we talk about it. back then. I we mean, I always hard. talk about it. The, some <laughs> of the best stories that, that we ever had were, I mean, and there were some legendary ones, but driving up to Montreal, you picking us up, you know, coming from Citroën, picking us up in Milton. I mean, there was one time, I think, the hockey bag got packed, but my, and, and obviously there was plenty of coolers packed, but the, uh, I think you left your suitcase. But his clothes were left in <laughs> yeah. the uh, yeah. Suitcases were left behind. He didn't need those. Uh, those you know, those type of road trips and memories. You my wife worked for FedEx. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all you needed was a pair of tidy whities and yeah. 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 But turn them inside out. That's, yeah. a, tough, that's a really tough question. That's How do you change your teams? Yeah. Because, so what do you do, right? So you have players who you're having success. We could never get a goalie. Like our 80 19 could never get a goalie. There's people who say to me, oh, well, why do we want to go? You guys don't even have any shots. And every year, we, we finally, the last year, won, won the champ, won it all. But we, we've been undefeated like two years and then lost in the playoffs because we didn't have a, a goal, you know. So we got Dougie Carr and he, he went on to U Lowell and yes. a kid named Eric Muscarelli. But they would say, well, he's not going to face any shots. I said, he's going to be facing hundreds of shots in practice against some of the best players in the league. But they wouldn't come, you know. And... Um, and then I remember literally one change we made was because of the parents. It was like, well, I just, we just don't want to coach it person. <laughs> so that's really hard. But you have players who are of higher ability than the players you're currently coaching who want, they call you to come and try out. What do you do then? Is it fair not to give them that opportunity? We didn't think so. But it was just like the 83s. Like we, I think the most changes we made in one year were three players. Mm. So you don't want to. Go, it's hard because you have that chemistry, you know? Right. And we had kids who really didn't maybe necessarily like each other, you know, for different reasons. But the, the way we coach and the way Buddy definitely coached was you may not like each other, but you're going to respect each other. And you're going to play, win and lose as a team, right. you know? And, and, and if you teach them that, you're ahead of the game. Yeah. Could you talk about, um, you know, coaching your kids, you know, because Brian and I are kind of in it right now and, what was the dynamic like, you know, like, was it, you know, I'm coach at the rank, dad at home, or was it even brought up, you know, because like there is, it is like a little different. He still makes me call him coach at home. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my wife. Yeah. <laughs> Over the dinner, tell, hey, coach, can you sauce Coach, me? can you pass the bottom? Yeah, yeah. sauce. Pass us on a four-letter word. 
uh, yeah. nah, it was it was hard growing up. But, yeah. um, it was a little easy with Brian, but you still you, you can't stand there and discipline another player, you know, and say, oh, he doesn't discipline his own coach. So it was probably even a little bit harder on my own children right. than it was 100%. on the rest of the team. But you know, Brian could take it. He could just swear under his breath. <laughs> and do the opposite. <laughs> do the opposite. <laughs> that was the same. Like Ryan, Ryan could take it, and Sean was just like me, except much better player, much smarter student. But he, <laughs> he um, it, I coached the offense just so I didn't coach the defense. Right. So he, Sean was on tape. But, um, it's hard because you, you, and I, I do think, and I told Sean this. I said I was definitely much hotter on him than I would have been on any other player. Yeah. So. Because it can go one way too, you know, like you're either hotter or you kind of giving him every opportunity to do, you know, the best he can do. And sometimes at the, you know, you know, the other parents are like, what's going on here? I've seen it both ways. Yes. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's much better for me, you know, in my opinion, to be a little hotter on him, but still fair, you yeah. know, but just, it's just easier, you know, at times. The guys wow. who coach and they also go, the kid plays shortstop in baseball. Yeah, exactly. He plays center in hockey. Yeah. You know, whatever he's the, he's the position, and the kid, and but that's the thing about Buddy, and I, I like to think I was the same way. We didn't just coach for our own kids; right. we coached for every day. Yeah. And the success that he had with, the, with those teams, uh, and the success we had with our team, uh, the '89s, it, it, it just you you're trying to get everyone to get to that place. Well, I think I think one of the things that both you guys taught me, especially now coaching it and coaching my three kids, was you never put your own kids before the the rest of the team. Right. You know what I mean? Like if anything, you know, and, and I try to do this myself is, is, you know, you put the other kids more on a pedestal than your own kids. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, I mean, I can remember walking out of games, even in college and like, Oh, you played tonight. You know what I mean? Like, you know, those <laughs> little subtle, those, those yeah, little subtle three assists. Yeah. yeah those, <laughs> little, those little subtle one liners, you know what I mean? That, that would sometime, uh, you know, irk you, you know what I mean? But they, uh, or serving the uh, bench minor. Yeah, 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 exactly. They're always serving oh, the bench minor. Always yeah. serving. <laughs> the name of the paper. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Actually, you don't even you get on the score sheet. Take a penalty. You can it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but I think that's a, it, it's, you know, I, I see so many coaches right now haven't done it myself, not for a long time, that coaches, you know, they're kids on the ice and they're lasered in and they're focused and, like, that's the only kid they're watching. A lot of times, you know, I come back to the bench and, and you know, my son will look at me. Oh, Dad, you see that? But no, I was coaching the other kids on the bench. I was talking through yeah. their shifts on, you know, on the board and coaching the, those guys up. You know, coaching as during a, the game. It's, well, good, it's a good time to do it. Absolutely. You know, and I, I can't stand, and, and it's another thing I love your dad for, is that he criticized. He, he, he would talk, but he would, quit, you know, he would take you off in the corner and, and, and he would constructively criticize right. and then he would compliment not you but he would but, <laughs> but he would compliment publicly yeah so compliment publicly constructively criticize priorly that's that's big coaching that's great yeah that's absolutely really i lived that all through high school and stuff like that and i you know even said to my players parents stuff, i'll never tear your son down in front of the team mm. i mean i'll grab him aside and say you know hey you suck tonight yeah yeah i coach great you guys suck yeah uh, <laughs> You know, you never tear them down. I always you know, just say, you're a better player than that. You can do that better. I said, do it this way and stuff like that. Never, you know, yell or scream at a kid like that. And it's funny, we were talking about coaching children. I, I actually had a have a word with your assistant coach a week or two ago, and it was a tight game, and this kid's son should have been on the ice, and yet he didn't put him up. Mm. And I went up to him out the game. He goes, you know, you don't have to, you know, do that to your, your own child or yourself. I said, put your best players on. Your right. son's the best player. Right. So put him on. You know? And I, 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 but again, he's like Brian and myself. And, and you know, you, you can't show favoritism towards your, your own child. That just opens it up for criticism. Right. And you get wrong. How's your parents? All right. And he's all good. Well, I, even thinking of that, when you were playing with that 83 team for a couple of years, you know, one of our coaches was big on stats, and he came up to me one time. He says, hey, listen, uh, I just did a statistic. 86% of our goals are scored by Brian, Brian, and Jack. Yeah, and yeah so we win. He says, yeah, people start to criticize me. Well, right, I'll make Brian a defensive. Huh? And then I think the next year we made Ryan a defensive. <laughs> right. yeah. 
Yeah. So that team was interchangeable. We had we had good players all the time. But the difference I can't imagine what you guys deal with now because the difference between the eighty threes when we looked in the stands during practice, there's no one there. The eighty nines, there are a few people there. Some with stopwatches, some with like noting the lines. So I, I don't even know what you guys deal with. <laughs> yeah. You know? And um it's hard because you have to let the coaches coach. It's it's almost like in school too. Like you're gonna have this teacher for a year. So pretty sure this teacher that's been here 20 years, they're not gonna change for you. So you just fit into it and then you know next year will come. Well with coaching, if, if you don't like the coach, there's plenty of opportunities out there, but you have to allow the coach to coach your player, your son, right. you know. And and if if you don't, then you're not really giving your son a fair opportunity. Because they're going to meet different types of coaches, and some some may not be good coaches. I was accused of that by a few parents, right. and now they didn't play the team next year. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the kind of already yeah. not yeah. changes. Yeah. 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 But it was six parents, yeah. right? <laughs> that's a big turnover. Absolutely. But so by like as far as you know, like what I've experienced with uh, Ryan, like it seems as though as he's gotten older, he's been a little bit more open to some of that constructive criticism. It's not negative, but just like making some corrections, you know, and he's like, all right, maybe you do know what you're talking about a little bit, yeah. <laughs> but as, as far as your kids, like, are they taking some of the stuff that, you know, you say to them, you know, pretty good as they get a little older here? Yeah, I think they've, they've been pretty receptive. And, and like you said, I think I learned from, you know, some of the best where it's, 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 you know, it's my approach with all the kids. It's kind of like, you know, Hey, here's my suggestion on this play you know what i mean like on the bench it's not like hey you have to do this every time and it's or or you know you should have done this you should it's like hey in this situation instead of you know whatever going d to d there maybe it was a quick up you know what i mean it's kind of like think about the other options don't just be narrow-minded and look at it like one way like that's the right play every time you know so right. i think that's my you know how I, you know, there's sometimes, right, where it's like, hey, you got to get that puck out of the wall, right? At the end of the game, there's a yeah, minute situational. left. Situational tendencies type of thing. But other than that, it's like, hey, you know, and even if you made a really good play, right, there might have been another good option too. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's you know, get them to think, you know, start thinking and processing the game. And, you know, and that's going to make them better players, I think, right? Because not hockey's not a black and white game. No, no. But there's some guys who coach that way. Yeah, they want you to do that every time, right? And it's not right. Yeah, and the in game with like my approach would be what they're going to see again within that game. So like we to your point, like if they're on the wall, you know, it's difficult for winners to make the right play all the time, right? But maybe you have three options. You know, there's another option. You know, center, eat it. You know, maybe you you know, can skate it and chip it, whatever. But what you're going to see again in that game kind of allows them to just kind of. Focus still on the game and not worrying about, you know, overthinking it. So it's just like one one little thing that I always try to try to do. What but to, you to your point, like you said, I think as you know, uh, you know, Brian's sixteen now, uh, you know, Collins thirteen. I mean, there's times when they give you like the blank stare, like <laughs> is this guy gonna, is he gonna stop talking to me type of thing with the ice cream thing? Yeah, yeah, like you know, like you gotta you want to crack him in the side of the head just to get some type of reaction from him. But I think you know, as they're getting older and uh, they, you know, I think they look and say, "All right, this this guy kind of knows what I'm talking about, and, uh, or what he's talking about." Yeah. yeah. And when he can't get his plane across, he has me take him to the game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 torturous forty five minute ride. Yeah. Well, that's the yeah, that was one of the questions I had written down. What was your you know your guys' philosophy? Because I, I mean, I can honestly say I don't really remember it. But what was your philosophy in terms of like the car rides, right? Because oh. you see so many parents that it's just. And we deal with it where it's like, well, I sent him in the game. He's got to do this. And you're like, how about just turning on, you know, the ring shrinks, the ring shrinks and just, you know, having a nice quiet car. Ride. I, I, I was about 50, 50. Yeah. you know, I, and I have to admit, I wish I wasn't as my, you know, like, well, let's look at that. You know, what you do here? What were you yeah. thinking here? But we, I love the car rides and I don't know how you guys deal with the car rides today, right? Because you have devices now, but like our car rides, I'm, I'm your car rides. <laughs> if Ryan had a phone, oh. At 12, 13 years old, that phone would have been thrown out on the mice, mass pipe Pretty multiple sure. times. Pretty Pretty sure. Sure. Multiple times. <laughs> yeah. Because I, you would have been talking and trying to break down the would, game, and he would have been looking at his, uh, you know, looking at his Twitter. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and, and he would have fired the thing. 
<laughs> you know, the thing when I hit the Burger King parking lot on the, at, at whatever rest area we're at. But just like pan, planning practices, like I kind of plan the rides, you know, like Walter Brown, you guys are off the ice. Call T. Anthony's, have a cheese pizza. We're waiting when we get to the top of the, I, you know, and we, and we, we had a great car one year. It was uh, Ryan, Jack Greeley, and Brendan Bryant. And that, and I'll never forget, they, so there weren't, and so Jack we, was asleep we, the whole we, time. Jack was asleep. Yeah, was. Jack would, we'd drop Ryan off at Vernon Road, and Jack would be asleep before I got him home to his house in the situation. <laughs> so it was unbelievable. But we would, um, I'll, I'll never forget, so we, we played this game, it was called Deep Questions. And, um, and I just read about it somewhere. It was like, uh, would you rather lose an arm or a leg? Would you rather be handsome and poor or ugly and, and wealthy? <laughs> and like to hear like nine and 10 year olds give answers to those questions. So there was a lot of that type of stuff. I played the music too loud, as they always say. <laughs> but, um, you know, you were in the car a lot that a lot. year too. And, and uh, your, your dad was running somewhere with um, Keith or but I see. And he, Brian was our fourth son. We'd love to have him down. <laughs> yeah. Just like uh, his son Brian, he was he was in fact, but it was just you know like planning like the rides, and I don't know if people do that. They say put your devices away so we can talk, you know. I don't I, because it's it, I see people just going around and they and you don't have that interaction. That, that was one of the most fun parts of coaching the rides yeah. up to Saint Sebastian's, up to BU, uh, yeah. to Walpole later with Sean. Those were great times. Well, you'll like it a lot when your grandson starts playing, Dan, because they'll be on their device and you can put the music up as loud as you can. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Might be some flying iPads. <laughs> <laughs> they'll be in the third row of the Suburban. Yeah. <laughs> he got <laughs> <reaching>. <laughs> The key seat behind Dad. Yeah, I can't touch you that way. <laughs> to reach back and grab a leg. Okay. Uh, that's Do good. you remember the car rides? Yeah, a lot. Um, really wasn't much discussed about the game. I, I didn't like to dwell on the positive or the negative. You know, just kind of like good game, you have fun. You know, that's more or less the philosophy I always said to my children: like, go out and have fun. You know, when it's not fun anymore, quit. You right. know, if you don't like it, I'm not going to force you to play. Yeah. You know, none of you ever going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but we didn't coach for that. That's a, no, that's I mean, well, that, that's a funny thing because now you know we're at that that time where I think that a lot of parents they have planned out every step, right? So oh. it's like, okay, at twelve years old, he's on this elite team. At thirteen years old, and then it's like, and now he's going to go to uh, Shattuck St. Mary's, and then he's going to go to to another place, and he's going to USHL, and then he's going to go to BC or UNH or, or BU. And then he's going to be in the NHL. And it's like, you know, uh, what was your guys' mindset? Because I think that that this day and age, it's like everybody th realistically thinks that, that that's going to happen. And it's not. No, it's definitely not going to happen. Um, it wasn't. We never. I never conceived yeah. any of my children playing pro hockey no. or anything like that. As a high school hockey coach, I always thought this stuff was, you know, enjoy your youth, play high school. Maybe go to college. I mean, my era there was one American in the National League, yeah. right? Tommy now, Williams, for crying out loud. Now so it's twenty-seven percent of the league. Yeah. So that's why people think it. Oh, it's twenty-seven percent of the league. We're in the twenty-seven percent. Well, it's still only one in a hundred who make, you know, even less. So, well, the way I always looked at it was, create good kids, and you're going to have good teams, and you're going to have fun. Like those are the three most important things. Good, kids. like in the '89 teams, like Danny Shakespeare, he was, he was serious, you know. We, we checked your grades. Like, we wanted to see your grades. And we had, what, three, four kids play Ivy League hockey out of that team. And thank God like, that didn't happen on the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that was I, a big, that was a two. big part of it. You're <laughs> straight, you straight B. Yeah, we had two Harvard straight kids. B's. That's why they brought up, right. the, they brought up the GPA. Right. Definitely. Two boys, <laughs> two men of Harvard. Yeah. But, uh, that, so that was it to have. And, and, you know, my big thing was uh, meaning clean on the ice and be a gentleman off the ice, you know. Uh, humble in victory, gracious in defeat. I think that's a big one, you know. And and you guys will. We, there were teams who would stuff it in our face when they beat us. Uh, oh, you yeah. know the eighty threes and the eighty nines. My favorite story is the Flames, the eighty nine Flames. They they won the playoffs three years in a row. We had the best record those three years. And finally, the year we didn't have the best record. We had pretty decent goaltending that year. And uh, Jimmy had a great game. Jimmy Hayes, and we we beat. Uh, 
BU, I remember, and then the Flames in the final, they had made a cake. Sure. And the cake said four in a row. Wow. And they didn't get, they ate, they ate the cake, but it probably didn't taste sexy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they did that to our 83 team, too, remember? That we spent so much time up in Quebec, we didn't have enough games, and they ended up winning the league. Oh, right. Because yeah. they had more points. We were right. supposed to play Undefeated some makeup team. games. Right. We were supposed to play some makeup games. They wouldn't let us play the makeup games because it was at Marlboro Arena. Yeah. And uh, we ended up, they won the league, but then in the, the championship is small. Yeah. yeah. Providence. Yeah. Good surprise. Do you want coaching? That was a good, pretty good game, actually. Right. Right. But uh, it was, you know, like that's the type, like that's the type of, like, they literally, you, your team was undefeated that year, but you didn't win the league because you didn't have enough points. Like that's the type of stuff. Sorry, we were in Quebec for a month. Yeah. yeah. I thought I was going to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> Ten days. I thought I'd be there for three. <laughs> Exactly. We're gonna make some T-shirts with uh, you know Danisms. You know? Oh yeah, that would yeah. Be, that would be all stolen. Car cakes. All stolen, but no. all stolen. <laughs> but uh, yeah, make, no, make that stuff. one. You know, uh, humble and victory, gracious in defeat. So that's a big one. And, and we, you know, guys didn't win every game. And right. you, know, you know, there was no stick slamming. There was might have been a little chasing around one particular play with a stick one night in Belmont Hill. <laughs> that was one of the best fights there. What? Sean Collins and oh. Brian McConnell. That, that was amazing. Like old school Belmont Hill stick fight center ice. <laughs> like it was, that was, that was Eddie Shack and Larry Seidel. That was, that was, <laughs> if there was iPhones today. Oh, oh God. Oh. Was, and you guys, I mean, compared to your era growing up, you should tell oh. us how soft we were. Oh. Nowadays, can you imagine? Now somebody, about yeah, it. sticks back then were wooden. Yeah, you <laughs> they heard break. it. They did break. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but Dad, I mean, talk about your your message too, because I mean, I can remember some of the conversations, and even going to play college hockey, like you said, as a high high school coach, so you dealt with a lot of really good, you know, high school hockey teams and players, and coaching in summer tournaments and things like that. So, what was your mindset with you know with with me and obviously with Keith? Well, again, go out and have fun, play hard, you know, uh, respect the game. Respect the referees, the coaches, stuff like that. And uh, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, I thought it was a good decision to be with Old Calvin Memorial. I mean, I know, you know, Coach Hanson was always had a reputation of being a tough coach, and you know, but his results spoke for themselves. And I knew your personality; you could take it, you know. So my philosophy going up, and a lot of people ask me after watching me play and Keith play, it was like, you know, how do I do it? How do I do it, my kid? I was like, go where the coaching's the best. You know, unfortunately, the parent was a goalie. I said, go with the worst team. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to see a lot of shots. <laughs> but, uh, That's why you couldn't get any goals. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> no, there was no standard philosophy. It just, again, play, have fun. And again, if you think, if you remember our youth, I mean, we watched hockey a lot. We went to high school games. We went to press school games. We watched the pro game. I, I'm a firm believer in watching the professionals play the game, their execution, you know, how we take it for granted watching TV, how good if they are, how accurate they're passing, stuff like that. So, yeah, if you're a good defenseman and an accurate passer and a good skater, you can make it. You know? Look at a kid like Maddie Grizzly can be a little bit on the size and the kids get a great outward pass. He moves up with the play. You know, I love watching those kids play. I, I, I like kids that complement one another. You know, that, that was something. And make Brian plays was, around you better. Yeah, yeah, when Brian was growing up, I think that's about the only philosophy I ever said to him when he was at Milton Youth Hockey. He was one of the better players and he got frustrated. He's making passes, making plays, and no one's scoring. I'd say, you know, you think you're good, make everybody else on the ice better. You know, yeah. And that's part of it. And that was that 83 team that we had with Kings, a very unselfish team. Yeah. You know, those kids moved the puck very well. Like, I can remember getting compliments from other parents, from other teams. Like, you kids move the puck so well. How do you teach that? Like I used my saying was only just get to teach them the passes and the four letter word. <laughs> so like, you don't have to just pass in the car. Yeah, right. Or gas. <laughs> yeah, but I remember uh, like reading an article about Ray Bork, and I was like, so impressed with him. He had been in the league like eighteen years at the time. I think his career lasted like twenty two years. And uh, he said, every time I step on the ice, I try to learn something new. This guy was an all star. So every yeah. time he stepped in the ice, he tried to do a little, little bit of something, yeah. you know, and philosophy along with um, 
you know, your teammates were the most important people on the team, uh, making them better. And it was just uh, like seeing that type of attitude and Buddy coached that, and Mark Fano coached that, you know, we tried to coach that with the 89s and it, it comes true that you, you, you get great kids out of that too. And I hate to see parents put their kids down. Like I've, you know, I, I used to talk about, per, you know, practice doesn't make perfect, perfect practice makes perfect. And then I started thinking about that and I was like, I don't like that because, per and so then it became perfect effort. You know, if you can give us your perfect effort, that's all we can ask. Right. That's all we can ask for. But I, I see like parents, I, I can remember like uh, kids would come up and you ask kids like, who wants to, you know, who wants to play in a uh, college hockey? Who wants to play at Harvard? Who wants to play in the NHL? Everyone would raise their hands, you know? And I said, and I would say, it just doesn't happen with what we do here. You have to go, when you're going home, you know, shooting pucks, you have to be getting stronger. What you do on the off ice translates, so how good a play you are on the ice. So a lot of kids think they can just show up and play, but like having that type of attitude of always adding to your game, always improving. I thought that was really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And going back to, uh, you know, the development of players and watching those top end players and learning from them, you can learn from watching. We we're fortunate, you know, I mean, maybe unfortunate, fortunate, but you have to sit there and watch the game. So I watched Ray Bork all the time. Right. Just try to emulate his game. Now, you, you still know, got the Brian Leach posters on the wall. Too. <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> Great yeah. play to emulate. Yeah. You know, it was like my brother, you know, and then Ray Bork and Brian Leach. You know, just go watch and see what you can do with your own game. But nowadays, the kids, and we talk about this a lot, like they have that instant feedback or not feedback but just they watch highlights versus yeah. the full yeah, exactly. game yeah. you know you're sitting there instead of watching wsbk and you know with the antennas you know they're just flipping on their phone and watching the cool stuff which doesn't really apply to their game and right. you know then they're practicing that you know like the michigan or whatever it's good to like work on your skills but what's going to be effective when the puck drops you want to be the best player you can be when the puck drops and that's like spatial awareness understanding how to use your teammates like you got you guys are saying making your teammates better which will make you better and that's the one disconnect that i see with like the technology with the kids you know oh i see that big time it, it, and it started way back when like I, when i was coaching at randolph high school i think pac-man came up and i mean like i said the, the joystick is ruining yeah. the athleticism of children a kid can't go out and throw a baseball and catch it and you know they're, they're great on the joystick you know, yeah. you know those idiots the video games. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's like you talk, you know, like my two favorite stories about attitude of improvement. Like Brady, Brady's a perfect example of attitude of improvement, right? But Larry Bird was a good one. So when he played as a rookie, he watched his tapes. He said, I can't use my left hand. I stink. So that summer, he went home and he took a bungee cord. He woke up in the morning and take a bungee cord and he'd bungee cord his right arm. He'd eat his cereal with his left hand. He'd have high school or college players come over in the court. He had in French Lick, Indiana. And then he had uh, played with his left hand all day long. And he went back and he was an unbelievable left-handed player. Sidney Crosby's rookie year, he finished last in face-offs in the NHL. Went home, he practiced taking face-offs. One knee on a milk crate, down in one way, on the ice trying to practice face-offs. Went back the next year, where, where did he finish in face-offs? One. One. Yeah. So, it, Forsberg. The, so when you get to, yeah, Forsberg. Yeah, Forsberg was the same way. His rookie year, he was you know, thrown around like most sweet time when he first moved to the league. <laughs> Went back and put on 15 pounds of muscle, come back and... <laughs> he threw everyone around. Threw everyone around the next... <laughs> Out of the club. 10 years, you know? <laughs> it's a great example of that. Yes. Yeah, but like you said, it's what you do off the ice. You know? I think Larry Bird had trouble wiping his ass, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he got good in his left hand. <laughs> yeah. he, became, <laughs> he could do both. <laughs> if he hurt his right hand, he could go to the left. It, it, I remember it, there was a story of him pouring in, like, 40 points, just played lefty, like, against... Seattle or Portland, yeah. I forget what I think it was on. Portland. Yeah. Yeah. He just went lefty all, all game. Right? And he said it to the guy that in the was that defending him. Yeah. He says, I'm going to play lefty and I'm going to get 40 on you. Yeah. And, he, and he did. I can remember the guy that was coming and said he did. He did it to me. <laughs> it's amazing uh, stuff. Yeah, so he was, those stories. Are, uh, that, those are the eras that we grew up in. You know? Yeah. But we took it for granted every year the Celtics were going to win the championship. Yeah. For being at 17, and, you know, years, I think. And, we didn't weren't that fortunate with the Bruins. You know? <laughs> we had the the aura. Oh, they should have won the three in a row. Kenny yeah. Dryden. 
69-7. Still he was a rookie, still right? Yeah, yeah, he was a rookie. Rogan Sean. I play, always blame my father for that loss. They lost in 60. Because <laughs> they were up 5-1. Andre Rashad scored a goal at the end of the second period to make it 5-2. And he said, that's going to be an important goal. I'm like, ah. And they put Dryden in. And he stood on his head the rest of the series. And they ended up losing. So they Game broke seven. every scoring record that year in the NHL. And... Uh, I said to my dad, I remember throwing pillows around and going, you caused that loss. You caused that to lose. <laughs> Jesus. That's the great thing about Dan. He does have a photographic memory. I mean, he can tell you. He tells you stuff about himself. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, about I do. Himself. I do. Well, uh, I can tell you a lot about you. I, it was such a pleasure watching both you guys play, though. Truly. Like, you understood the game. Two-time All-American after UNH. Hobie Baker winner. Like, you guys really got the game how to move the puck, how to be a great teammate. And you were great teammates, too. So I have to tell you that. It was a pleasure watching. Well, I appreciate that. You know. yeah. Why ever hope you Baker? I want to win some of the most humble people you ever met. I know. You know Mike, uh, Chris Drury. Oh, yeah. yeah. Guys like that. Yeah. Jimmy Vesey. You know, guys like that. Yeah. 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 Just, you know, good people. I, I, I say it was a weak year. Oh, is that uh, there you go. How blue victory? An eagle hadn't won it in a while. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. No, we actually had two guys, so they didn't do like the the, the final three of the hat trick. It was more just like the top ten. And two of my teammates were Jeff Arcus and Brian Gianta were also nominated. That's so funny. we had a good team. We just pushed the puck, and it was just uh, we had a, a good group. So that was. Easy moving it up when you had those guys. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, take it. No, I got an assist there. <laughs> yeah, I got an assist from behind my old <laughs> three home right. goal. Right. Three. Gi think comes back and gets some gas on the PP, and the next thing you know, it's in the back of the net. I get a second. second hey, Bergie, stop and point. <laughs> that assist is funny. Um, can we talk about like managing expectations, right? So obviously Ryan, you know, was was a highly touted guy, right? Ended up being the fifth overall pick. Keith was, you know, one of those guys that that you know he could have been a first rounder, could have been a, a third, fourth, well, you know, kind of could have gone anywhere. But do you remember like the draft and the process and all that stuff, what it, what it was like dealing with that and expectations. The scariest moment I had was uh, got a call from the Halifax Moosehead guy on the phone. You drank the beer. That was a yes, beer. yeah. yeah. Was and, uh, he started at like. Fifty thousand dollars, because I said we're you know we're dedicated that Ryan's going to go to college. Like we want Ryan to go to college. And there's no there was no doubt about it. And um, and I, I I understand the junior system, but when you're 16 and 17 years old, and you have to practice like a pro schedule and play a pro schedule, unless you're physically ready to do it, like I always talked about, be dominant in a level before you move to the next level, and. Um, if you're not ready for that, it, it could lead, you'll never make it. You know, you could get beat up in the juniors. But even then, you know, Ryan was, this is when Ryan was 14 years old. So I get this phone call and Ryan was going to be eligible for the Q draft that year. And the guy started, and he, and he, he ended his conversation at $200,000. He said, we'll put $200,000, we'll put $200,000 away for him. I said, how much for me? No, I said, we put $200,000 away in his name. And he can, you know, he can go to college. He'll never have to worry about college, even if he doesn't make the pros. I said, well, I think he wants, I'm thinking in my head, he wants to make the pros. And I don't think this is the best avenue for him. Because you had Jack Park over at BU, great coach, unbelievable practices. You practice, your practice to game ratio is three to one versus one to three up at, up at, up there, you know. So um, it, it was, it was alarming. But when I got off the phone, I said to Sue, I said, I, I, I think, you know, because Sue said to me, I remember she looked at me, she goes, you think we're holding him back? I said, well, we are in that regard, but we have to, mm, you know? Right. So I said, but we need to get some advice. And that's when Bobby Orr came into the uh, picture. And Bobby looked and he goes, no, no, he, he's going to college. He needs to go to college. And um, it was good to have that confirmed, but right. that that's pretty... Coming know, from a Canadian guy, too. Yeah, yeah, but that was pretty... Uh, pretty mind-blowing you know to to hear that conversation so yeah, to tell you your 14 year olds 200 grand yeah mine's just costing me that yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah around that time i was at bc and i came back and skated at there and um you know i see this tall drink of water yeah a stack of dimes neck you know with, yeah. with, with good good feet good stick i'm like you know just he has something there and, and i i told him you know we talked about it before but uh, but he, he would walk the line. He was doing a lot of stuff, but he, he just wasn't filled out by any right. means. 
Yeah. But he could he could play. Looks like Bambi. On yeah, he did. I thought you were talking about Port Salt. <laughs> <laughs> it, they were there together, and you yeah. know it was just one of those things where you know Brooks has obviously filled out, you know, a bunch more. But he was he was tall and skinny like Ryan, and oh yeah, then he put the work in. But he Brooks, did. But Ryan was was always you know you could see it like he was processing. He had good skills, and, you know, the size, and uh, it was just interesting when I come back and you know, it was like a. Uh, Christmas skate and I'm like this kid kid, kid has something but that was, that was the right decision for you guys I'm sure it was difficult for a short time but everything worked out yeah it, it did. and and with his injuries that could have happened in junior hockey right. you know yeah so you never you never know right, right. And, uh, it was it was just looking at it, it was just I see a lot of guys like I remember you talk to kids about do you want to make it you know and do you want to play college hockey and they're all like yeah 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 and I've heard I've heard parents say well you better study hard because you're not going to make it and I, I I've let the, I've I'd say that but you can't say that to them mm. you know you don't want you're not going to crush their dream they could they actually could make it and Keith's a perfect example of it Ryan's a perfect example of it there's so many kids that you guys you guys you know you take it for granted how many NHL players you. You know, right. I mean, this guy played in the league. That yeah. great. You know, it's 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 unbelievable because it, it does happen if you, you you first you have to see it and then you have to believe it and you, and you don't want to. And I would say to kids like you know whether it's Carlton Fisk up in Vermont or whether you know guys who make it they're from here. Right. You can make it. It's just what are you going to do to make it? Right. So, but you and. And invariably, like all those kids, like you think of all the kids out the 83 Kings, the 89 Kings, and all these other teams, whether it's the Islanders, or, they're, playing, they're playing college hockey. That's a very small percentage of kids who play college hockey. Right. And that's whether it's uh, at Middlebury or whether it's at BU or BC. Right. Okay. You know, and that's and, and who are your best friends for the rest of your life? Oh, those guys. Those guys you played at Middlebury with. The guys you played at St. A's with. It's not just BU, BC, or Minnesota, or those kids. It, it's... Those are the guys you remember. Those are the guys at your wedding. Those are the guys yeah. at your wedding. Those party. are your locker room buddies. Yeah. 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 What about Keith's uh, adventure? Keith's adventure. No, I, I just mean in, in terms of the draft. And I mean, you can break down. I mean, Keith's never talked about it, but I mean, Keith went to, I mean, you made the decision to not even send Keith to a private school as a freshman in high school. Right. So, right. you know, kind of walk us down that road a little bit. Well, um, yeah, his freshman year, he went to Milton High School. And again, I was involved in coaching, so my games conflicted. I didn't really get to see him play that often. Same thing with you. But, uh, and I kept getting reports that, Jesus, you know, a lot of my friends coached at Norwood High and Westwood and stuff like that. And, uh, this kid's unbelievable. He's a freshman. He's like, Tim, and I'm like, really? So I rescheduled a few of my games so I could get to see him play. Who is he? What number? What, what number is he? she going? <laughs> what number is the kid? Is that mine? <laughs> Where'd you get those gloves? <laughs> but uh, it's funny, it's draft year. I mean, it, well, to no. say that too, he was at Milton High, and you, like you said, though. But Danny Shea was there that year yeah, as Danny, a coach, right? Yeah, Danny coach. knew the game and was a really good player at BC. Yeah. And then I remember being at Cushing because that was my senior year. And, and you know, just like you said, the, the cross, I'm like, hey, my father, like, I guess Keith's pretty good. And I remember Steve Jacobs going down and watching him and him coming home and being like, holy shit. He's yeah. like, no, Keith's like real. Yeah. And I was like. Oh, well, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, he started yeah. a fight in the playoffs because he lose his last game so against Jerry Moffat, our goalie from Jerry the '83 Kings. Yeah, he's drafted. He, he, he was. Uh, I mean, Keith could have still have gone back to prep school. He could have gone to juniors. And so we didn't know what he was going to do. So no team was going to take a chance on him. I was told the year before he should have applied early because that was a weak draft and he, and he probably would have gone high. But as it was, he went like the fourth round. Yeah, fourth round. Because no one was sure what he was going to do. And, and truthfully, I wasn't sure what he was going to do. You know, I didn't know he couldn't spell U N H. <laughs> <laughs> if you spotted the U in the end, you know, you're <laughs> fine. But yeah, my, you know, again, we, we thought he was going to go play with one year with Brian. Yeah. So I quit coaching to see that. And uh, actually, his mother was the biggest influence in him going up to the Quebec League. Mm -hmm. Like she just said, the other one had always said, play until you play his strengths. And, you know, he was never the greatest student. And uh, 
College just wasn't for him. He had already gone to P one H for four years. I forgot all about that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, but just, he just he just did weekends. Well, yeah, you know, yeah. This is the story on Keith, though. Let's understand. Like he didn't like school, but he's weak. My boy is weak and smart. Yeah, he, he's a smart kid. He is. He, he knows his stuff. Oh yeah, that. he's a fat smeller. Fat <laughs> smeller. <laughs> what was the uh, when the the Brown coach called? What's that story? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, the Brown coach called, and uh, he had gotten a lot of calls. Actually, coach yeah. Miami or Ohio called, and I know they're like the, like the Harvard of the Midwest. And the Brown coach, I kind of got sick and tired of feeling these calls, knowing he's never going to go to college. And I'm like, Brown University, you're an Ivy League, right? Yeah. Well, Brown, the only Brown he's going to see is in his underwear. <laughs> <laughs> And Keith tells a story too. It's funny you bring up, uh, you know, you got to give uh, mom a little shout out. But you know, she was, you know, I think she just saw it in Keith's and in, in, you know, in Keith's face. Okay, I don't, you know, I want to try this thing out in, in, in Canada, right? But I think the expectations, even going there for you guys, when you were having those conversations, it was like, hey, good luck. Hopefully, it works out. But if not, you, you know, like your chances are very small. You know, best effort that you can e- into it, but you know if it doesn't work out, like you know, you'll be joining the military or you'll be you'll be doing something because you're not yeah. gonna you know whatever come home and be a, a, a trash man. Well, that's an and it still applies today. Once you go up there, they consider it a professional hockey, so you can't come back into the United States and play college. Right. So I mean, you can come back and play baseball or football or something like that, some other sport. But you know, you'd have to stay up there in Canada to go to you know. Donald McGill or someplace like that. He can't play D1. He could have played NESCAC. Oh, could he? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> no, I don't know if he was getting into yeah. a NESCAC. You don't want to hear what I said in the middle of the coach. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. He pissed all those guys off. <clears throat> I can imagine what middle bar he could bring in your mind. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, that's awesome. Well, I mean, that being said, too, I mean, Ryan had the opportunity when we were younger to to – Go out to the national development program, and you held him back a year. You know, you yeah, made two years actually. So. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, he wasn't too happy about that the second year, but uh, that was kind of selfish too. I just, you know, I, I knew it's, it's a short, short time. You know, and uh, when he left, he was going to be gone, and that's the way it was. Uh, right, you know. And as they are buddies, you know, as, like you're saying, lifelong friends. You know, yeah, a couple more years in high school. You know, around the same. Doing the same things outside of you know hockey as well. And when you go out there, it's all hockey all the time. And I think it just I think that was a good decision. Two more years of development, just personally, and, and kind of expanding your friend you know uh, group. And, and yeah, I he was the first one to have a license too, so it was good to yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. We needed those rides. Hey, come pick me up. <laughs> Can you come grab me a cushion? <laughs> it's right down the street. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's great. You know, just that's true cool. about those lifelong friendships. I, I don't know why, but I, it seems hockey for that one sport. Yeah. I mean, when I was a few, we won the national championship, but I still keep in touch with some of the kids on that team. Sure. You know, and they just develop over the years and they, they never lose. If you don't see them for 20 years and you want it to them, it's just like old, old home week, you know. Yeah. Lacrosse has a little of that too, though. Because they, they, they're maniacs like hockey players. Yeah. Too. Because Colin, like, Lax he, Bros. Yeah, Colin played at Connecticut College. And, like, I can think of, like, four of his best buddies, they, they played there with him. So that, that group remains tight, you know. Right. Baseball and football, it doesn't seem the same. But with yeah. hockey and lacrosse, you know, it, uh, it, it, they really are lifelong friends. Some I think it's the men's league, league still. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys playing up until they We're all getting in there. Right? Right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's absolutely. what I used to say to him. You know, you're you're gonna end up in the men's league, so right. Unless you're too injured to do it. So <laughs> but uh and Sean saw that and Sean too, his buddies from Cornell, like the, all the kids he had, it's like the, the, they were all guys he played with. Right. So this is great. Yeah, I just think the sport lends itself to a certain characteristic and you know, all the things that you guys are talking about from the coaching side of things, it just implements a good person, team. And then you can apply that to anything you do in life, yeah. you know, right. Work, you know, the, the discipline, you know, the work ethic, and then just working within a team to accomplish like a common goal. It's all 
great stuff that it can translate and you can apply to whatever you do. But you know, the I talked to like a bunch of like media people who cover like the four major sports. I mean, like hockey guys are always the ones that you know we like to talk to, and they have a, a good kind of approach to you know the team game and versus the other sports. So, right, and, and that's why I encourage my kids to play. Really, you know, it helps them become more of a well-rounded person. Oh, I've seen that. It's really good. Same thing talking to media people, and they always say, "But it's just so much easier to talk to a hockey player. You know, they just appreciate everything they've got, everything they've got. You don't see. I, I mean, no matter what sport you're going to find, you're, you're vulnerable for that. I think the hockey players, you know, admire a lot. And again, it's the, it's the team. It's, mm-hmm. it's the way they've been coached. It's the way they've been raised. And you know, they're just a product of their environment. And yeah, I said it's a million high school players. And, you know, the effort you're putting here today, you know, you, you continue with through college. A guy that's running a business is going to say, wait, wait a second, you play you know, hockey, you play soccer, you kick up a good group, you great point average. Of course, I might want my team at yeah. this company. I said, so, you know, your, your dedication to team work here. Well, I, I once had a hedge fund guy tell me that, that I used to, you know, that I know. He said, we look for division. Division three, all Americans. Um, right. He's like, because they're at the point where, you know, like you just said, we're at, you know, Amherst or Williams or Bowden or, or wherever it is, right? But, you know, it's very easy to just be like, you know what? I'm just going to focus on my school and, and not do it. But if this kid is dedicated to his craft enough that, like, he wants to put in the work and the effort on the ice and, or, you know, or on the field, wherever it is, and, then also become, you know, like work to that level and that, you know, all American status. He's like, that's, you know, and, and never mind if they're an academic all American as well. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, you're putting in, like you, you're hitting them from all angles, you know, because if there's one thing you say, oh, you know, yeah, I, I graduated summa cum laude or whatever the heck it is from, from this school, right? But we're also, <laughs> <laughs> clearly I wasn't on that list, uh, University of Phoenix, maybe. But the, you know, the, the, the academic piece and then the athletic piece is, is, you know, I was like, wow, that's. Well, asking you guys, I'm curious, don't you think that uh, maybe even more, but the Division three players deserve just as much credit as D1 players? Absolutely. Because they don't get the same support system. Right. But then they're playing the sport. Right. And then they have to get the grades. And they're not being handed guts in all these easy classes. Right. Or having their girlfriend write their paper for them. <laughs> well, you never know. Yeah, that's true. Guys, yeah. Like, yeah. They yeah. might be able to work that out. A little of that. But, like, I, I did, and you guys played, I, I look at some D3 games now, and, like, it's amazing oh, yeah. level of hockey. It's very good. It's, it's like, how did that kid not make it to that? Like, we talked about AHL and NHL players earlier. But how did, how did they miss that kid? He could be playing D1, you know? And it, there's a lot of things that go into it. Right. Well, I think now, and I wanted to ask you, and, and I'm sorry to cut you off, Mons, but it's like, what's the difference in the game today? Like, because like you just said, I think, you know, you go to a Division three game, and it's like, wow, every one of these kids can skate. Every one of these kids can shoot everything. But what's the difference? Is it the hockey sense piece? Like, you know, I, there's, 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 there's something. Yeah. It's got to be something. Yeah. I think it might be a little bit of a hockey IQ, to mm-hmm. be honest with you, but the kid, you know, Take plays where they go to die. You know, it's like mm-hmm. he just can't. He just but can't you look at him in warm ups and he's and, buzzing. Right, right. He's skating all over the ice. But uh, but it's amazing the level of skating. Because when I was in college, like there was a difference between a D2 hockey player and a D1 hockey player. Like couldn't skate as well. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he, he didn't have the same shot. He wasn't as strong. But now I look at all those kids. They, they're working off the ice all the time. They're working with guys like Boyle, you know. Oh, yeah. And uh, what's the kid, EPS? Uh, yeah, Brian McDonough. Brian McDonough, he, he writes great programs down there. Mm-hmm. It's it's just amazing uh, to see the level of uh, skill with these kids. So I think it really must come down to the way they think the game. Yeah. I mean, you see it all the time. What do you I see it all. I see it from the pros to the Division ones to the Division three players. I, I, I mean, I have a nephew that plays you know, cousin <laughs> in Division three. It's a speed game. It's a not the south jackrabbit race you know no one has the sense to slow the play down and let things develop it's rush to the net rush to the net i actually watched them play this year and it's gotten better a little bit better but you see the kids at the northeastern and harvard and dc and bu they they learn how to you know slow the play down and neutralize be patient let plays set up 
you know, those don't come in a straight line, set up your angles and stuff like that. Then you watch the pros, and it's even slower. Mm -hmm. You know, that, yeah, yeah. They, they make it look slower because they're just so good, you know, yeah. skill wise. Yeah. But it's not a not the self game. You see the pastor and acts. You see the you know the great players in the NHL. They go in, they make that Chicago turn, they wait for plays to, to set up, and they can move up. A 60 foot pass or a six foot pass, you know, they just have the hands and the, you know, the physical talents to make that happen. So I think that's the biggest skill. And, and I can remember even when I was playing at Boston College, we didn't play Boston State. You played Boston State when you were pieces? No. Lucky. <laughs> uh, but they were kids from Boston State, but every kid as good as us. Yeah. Kids that, you know, I go, they were on the all school asset team, so they, but they, just didn't think the game as well as well as, as, as the Division One players. And I, I, I think it's the same way still. I haven't been to a number of BU DC games this year. But it, I don't know. It was a, that was a, nine, football, nine, it was a football game. Yeah. Take the field goal. Yeah. But I, you know, another t shirt for you, and this is Buddy's, but he forgets his quotes. But the best quote he has about that part of the game is 80% of the time you've got to go 80 miles an hour, 20% of the time you've got to go 20 miles an hour. And that's what's maybe missing at that lower level mm -hmm. is that they can't slow the game down. That's a great way Buddy put it. They're like jackrabbits up, down, north, south, north, south. And when it comes to east, west and slowing the game down, looking behind you, you know, thinking the soccer game and hockey, maybe it's not done as well at that level. I don't know. But I thought that was a great tip. I use that a lot with my kids. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's and that's like one of those light bulb moments, visual for a kid. Oh, I understand. You know, it's not always going as fast as you can. We knew players like that. Yeah. And they played in D one too. Million dollar legs <laughs> with the ten cent head. Right? Right. That was that. That was the other and neat big T shirt. <laughs> <laughs> no, you make all separate. You got you to get the extra SKU. You don't put it all in one shirt, bud. <laughs> <laughs> Looked like a street hockey tournament on the back yeah. with all the sponsors. <laughs> Looked like a European hockey team. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Advertising. Uh, <laughs> but that to your point about you know the process, like, it was almost easier to play in the NHL versus the AHL. Ryan said that. Because it was just, everyone's trying to do their, their thing to get, get called up or whatever. So people would be out of position, whereas in the NHL, everyone has kind of a role. And so if you could process, it was easier for me because I knew where guys would be consistently. And then, you know, I got cleaned out a few times because guys were out of position in the AHL. I'm like, he shouldn't be there. So I thought I had more time. I'm just, <laughs> you know, getting clean. But um, yeah, but just... Almost slowing it down, like you said, playing your, your position and doing it well, though. Some guys, you know, that when you can duplicate what you're good at, it's not like the sexiest thing on the score sheet or to the fans, but you're valuable to the team. So then you, you can be able to, uh, you know, exit the zone, you know, consistently, using the middle of the ice, whatever it is. But um, it, for me, it was it was a little bit tougher in certain areas, like, you know, when I had to defend or, or do something. But with the puck, I thought it was a lot easier. It was, it was interesting. Never had right. Nathan McKinnon come no. down. <laughs> uh, Ryan said that he could put it in someone's feet and they would get caught. There you go. You yeah. Know, it was like, yeah, you know, exactly. you could make oh, a bad yeah, pass yeah. and it was, looked like a great pass. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. The players know, the coaches know. Yeah. Not many fans do. <laughs> no. What about your guys' philosophy on a, playing other sports and these kids these days? We see so much specialization. Wow. I was raised by a father that said, you know, every sport in its season. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Baseball season, pick up a glove. We didn't have lacrosse in Charlestown. Bank robbery. I mean, um, <laughs> <laughs> that was a sport. Yeah, that was, 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 that was the spring. You know, <laughs> we didn't have much soccer, but you know, football, baseball, you know, every sport in the season. That's the way, more or less, you, you were raised. You know, try other sports. I think you have to be, I think you have to trick your body into becoming a better athlete. You know, I, I, one of the philosophies that I was taught, you know, say you're a power lifted for the Olympics and you know you can you can bench press 600 pounds but you have to trip your other muscles into getting to 625. Mm -hmm. You can't just lift weights by doing it you've got to do other things. So again I think that's another European philosophy those kids are always going soccer they usually use their hands the tennis and all right. everything else but I, I don't like the 12 months out of the uh, hockey. I don't we do a burnout factor too. Not only does those sports assist you in becoming a better hockey player, but it's like you're 14 and you, you know. And then a lot of those kids, they were stars at nine. So we used to have a saying, like a star at nine surrounded by stars at 14. 
So everyone catches up with the level, but some of these other kids are playing other sports. This kid's only been playing hockey for 14 years. He's like, Another I'm done. Now everyone's <laughs> the same as me. I'm not any good anymore. Instead of, okay, I got to keep adding to my game. Like, I'm not any good anymore. It's the coach's fault. Or it's, you know, my mom and dad. And they stop playing. And it's, it's such a loss for the game, you know. And if they had a thirst for the game, if you make them hungry, you know, um, you would have played if if your dad let you. Ryan Ryan would have played twelve months. Yeah, you love the game. You would have done it. But it was like, no, we're going to the beach. But I think that's <laughs> the. It's funny you say that much. You must see it. I mean, you definitely see it. But it's like, oh well, he really wants to do it. Yeah, you know, or she really wants it, to do it. That could be very true. Right? Yeah, but it's like but, you know, and and okay, well, your kid would want ice cream every night of the week, right? Or, there you or, go. or they're eating McDonald's seven right. days a week. Do you let them? Right. You know, like, that's your job as a parent. It's, it's very true. Yeah, and like Bork and Leach, they, they always talked about putting a bag away in the spring. You know, they played baseball and yeah. did a bunch of different things. And it also gives you body arrest, those muscles. Mm -hmm. It's not a natural movement, but, you know, just, you know, kind of recouping the muscles that you, you know, kind of burn out a little bit over the season. And then, you know, just athleticism and transferable skill sets, which will make you a better hockey player. And that's, right. that's kind of something we always talk about. I can remember one of the fastest skaters I ever had at Randolph. I had this kid talking about a million dollar legs with a two cent head. But he was a BMX bike rack when it first came out. Yeah. And this kid could fly on a bike rack. Man, could he fly on the ice too. Yeah. I mean, he couldn't catch a pass and shoot a pot right now. It was always that regular. It was like the kid in the Mighty Ducks. <laughs> so, you know, I, I went to BC with kids like that. Yeah. Didn't they? Open the Zamboni doors. Oh. Go right through. <laughs> Forest County. <Yeah. laughs> oh, it's classic. Classic. But that's why it's so important. Like, what you have to teach, you know, brilliant in the basics, right? This I see kids play D1 hockey. I see kids play NASCAR. I see them play high-level hockey. They slap their passes. They don't slide their passes. Mm -hmm. they, ca they can't catch a pass because they're catching it from the middle to the end of the blade rather than the middle to the heel. Mm -hmm. Like, those are the things you were taught. At a right. very young age, they were automatic to you, and you teach them now. Never yeah. mind but, a backhand pass. Oh my gosh! Yeah. You never see a back or take a backhand. Yeah, right. Johnny right. Pierce is rolling around in his grave. No <laughs> one takes backhanders anymore. Right. But um, like, it, it is. It's it's those little things that make up a complete hockey player. I remember I had the hundred points of hockey. I don't know what happened on the list, but you know, number twenty percent of it was twenty points for being a good teammate. You know, but then it was all like five points for sliding your pass, you know, five points for catching pass, playing with your head up, communicating was 10 points. Mm -hmm. And we would in practice the 89s, if they weren't talking, I said it earlier, we'd, we'd make them skate because that is such an important part of the game. And you see kids who are so quiet on the ice, you know, they're shy off the ice. Like, you got to talk out here. He doesn't know where you are. You know, well, I had that's the, how you get I, cleaned up a lot. Yeah, right? Your teammate doesn't say heads up. And well, oh. well, the other thing is it has to be the correct communication because if they give you some false information, you get banged out. I, yeah. You're gonna I'm gonna come down your street. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I said that I, I had the same conversation the other day with my kids, and you hate to like revert it back to, to your team, like, oh, you know, when I was younger I did this, but I was said Mikey Morris, right? He was a first round pick on on, on our eighty three team. But he was a very quiet kid. I used to drive with him. He lived in Dorchester. Right. I would get rides with him Great to practice and his father's unbelievable player. But he wouldn't tell you if your shirt was on fire. You know right. what I mean? But on the ice, you talk about, and Moss talks about it all the time, like effective communication. Like you knew if he was like calling for the puck, he was open. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. You knew like if somebody was on you and, you know, it was like, you know. Come and come, like, you're like, yeah. oh, boy, somebody better be but leave it. it you that, know, just like, yeah, that effective, you know, drop it. Like, he didn't have to say much, you know what yeah. I mean? And he didn't say much. And, and you know, as he got older, obviously, he became, uh, you know, more and more talkative. But he was a quiet kid. And But that, you know, he communicated. And, and God, what a player. Oh, yeah. And I think that helps develop the hockey IQ because you're watching the game. You're seeing, you know, like, the next step, the next play. 100%. And you're trying to help your teammate along the way. And then... You know, I just think that's something, I, the communication is, is lacking a lot in, you know, youth for sure. Because, number one, they don't want to, you know, be loud. Well, the, you can't text somebody on the ice. <laughs> there you go. There you <laughs> you go. And everyone's got that same snap, 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 like you stick on the ice. Oh, the beaver tail. I, I remember saying to my players when I was coaching in high school and stuff like that, Coach, I was wide open, you know, Johnny would pass up, I think. I said, did he yell to me? He goes, well, I didn't hear you on the bench. If I got yeah. hear you on the bench, he probably didn't hear you on the ice. Right. 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 And then you get the guys who are 7-11, you know, always open. 
Oh, even, yeah. even though they're Chad they're, Ocho Senko. Yeah, even though they're covered. <laughs> That's yeah. me and Men's. Uh, yeah, oh, of course. Sorry. I'm coming late. Just throw it that way. <laughs> you can't yell from the stand either. They don't hurt. They don't hear you from the stand. Right. So one of my favorites Shoot. is, uh, what is it? Uh, players play, coaches coach, parents watch. You know, and, they, and, that, and those are the best parents who just sat there and watched and, and, and uh, stood behind the glass. Mark, Tom, Mark, Mark Thomas's dad, uh, you know. Someone that played with Brian. Someone, someone we use it with. Yeah, you yeah. said it to him, and the guy years later come up and he goes, "Hey, I learned one of great philosophy from hockey from Dan Whitney." That yeah. you told him, he goes, "Players play, players play, play. You know, coaches coach, and parents watch." I forget who that other guy was. Henry, maybe. Oh, maybe it was Henry Stahl. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I think, think he been. knew. A, he might have been teaching you a few. Oh years. my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what a guy! Got what a guy! Out of growing grass and cannabis. Oh boy! <laughs> I got yeah, a, in Thunder Bay, Ontario. He has a sod company. I mean, I got a sunshine sod if you're out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, no free ads. It's a bit <laughs> uh, I got a question for you because you guys have seen the hockey, at, you know, obviously from the 60s to now. The best youth hockey player you saw, uh, have ever seen. And you can't say me. <laughs> <laughs> or Jersey Shore. I'd say Sean Collins. That he was he was the kid that I, I I remember distinctly. There was another kid named Steve Jacobs growing up that was uh, not Steve Jacobs. Steve, uh, I forget his last name from Winchester, and he was a great player. And he just he gave into other things, extracurricular stuff off the ice. But he was a terrific player. Not terrific. Steve Jacobs. No, not, not Steve, Steve Jacobs. <laughs> I can't remember his last name. I just mean in the actual right. right. Yeah. And his name might have been Steve Jacobs, but uh, he, yeah, he, I think it was. And he, he was, he was terrific playing with just. But I, I thought Sean, Sean could, Sean could tool on a lot of kids. Sean you know? could control. I mean, he could. Yeah. I think he had a hundred points in Metro. You know, no one kept. We never kept track of the stats. You know, no. we never. We did the eighty nines. We never shared them with the team. We what was I saying then? Statistics with the losers. Yep. <laughs> and, a goal, and another one, a goal and an assist, both worth the same. One point. You know. How about you? Um, I'm trying to think of a kid who's uh, up in state New York. They drafted by the Islanders. Oh, Is Shrimp. That oh, Robbie Shrimp. Shrimp. Robbie, yeah. Shrimp. 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 Robbie Shrimp. He was he was a highlight reel to himself. Yeah. He was yeah, really He good. was unbelievable. Yeah. But that was during, I know, like any team that reeled him in. And maybe he used to play for the Montreal team. Oh, and, oh he would go play everywhere. And yeah. I remember playing against like the first kid that get on the ice. I'd put a, you know, Alex Barry or someone big and tough and that goes, Knock him down. Yeah, he's yeah. not gonna. He, it's gonna go away. Yeah, but he's a kid. Well, you that, wonder if that kid got burned out the way he. Played. Yeah, that he played. Well, but yeah, but he's, he's a kid that if you look at the the like, I saw something. I, I mean, I, it might have even been Chicklets here. They like post like, all right, what player from like you know that was previously drafted, and a couple guys that came to mind was Robbie Shrimp was unbelievably skilled. Like meaning they could play today with all the skill that goes yeah. on, mm -hmm. right? Right. And but like. Another one that, like, Chris O'Sullivan, like, yeah. you guys remember him, like, yeah. EU and yeah. stuff like, like, if Sully played, like, with his side, you know, obviously, oh, yeah. but he just came in where it was like, you know, it was Brent Sutter wanted him to be like a glass and out type of defenseman, type, right. you know what I mean? Right. And it was like, but his skill level was, was oh, phenomenal. I mean, he, could, I he played forward on that 95 uh, national, national championship team. Right. team. And he was putting up points. He was a top line player. He could go back on D on the power play. He could do. I think so the much. next year they just moved him back to D. Yeah. Like, he, and it, like he, wherever they wanted. If he wasn't injured, he would have played. He would have a very good pro yeah. career, too. Yeah, and he, he was fun. He really saw the game so well. Yeah. He was fun to watch. Yeah, yeah. he was great. Yeah. yeah. But that was my. Parker was, was yelling at him when Travis Roy got hurt. Right. He didn't see Travis. He did not. Jack Parker yeah. didn't see the Travis Roy hit. His, yeah, he uh, had a Sully down just the run. And he had just done a, a Sully where he did the matinee on dance. Yeah, and uh, he was saying we don't do that at BU, and that that's when uh, Travis hit the dash. I think Sully did the old like Superman pose going through center ice. Oh, <laughs> or something. It was it was yeah. it was something along those lines. Yeah. Who who were you gonna say in your era? Well, probably the best one was uh, Robbie Fatorik. Yeah, yeah. The movement that went right out of high school went to the pros. He I played with some great, very influential in my career, with them, like just in Charlestown alone, like the Fiddler Brothers. Yeah. You know. You know Joe was a great player, and he was around the Torx age. Yeah. And then, right. so Joe was two years old. I mean, Michael was two years younger than me. You know, Mark was probably. Mark was a crazy, years. crazy yeah. youth hockey player. But they, they, <laughs> they, they were great up. hockey players, and they, yeah. you know, they, they could do just about anything. Uh, even Joe's. 
cousin was in Bobby Ridge, was my captain of Malden Catholic, and he's captain of Boston College. So, you know, they were kids I, I, I probably had some of the greatest players, but a lot of good players, a lot of good kids from like Beverly and Lynn, uh, the Gilligan yeah. brothers, and uh, I'm trying to think of a kid from, from Lynn that played, he was the assistant coach at Merrimack for a while. McClurk? No, no. Billy McClurk. Billy, no. Billy was a good player. McClurk was like, oh, so French Billy. Canadians up there. No, Stewie Billy Irving. Can't Stewie, Stewie Irving. Irving was that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Stewie, yeah. Stewie you were a great man. hockey player. Uh, no, no, who am I thinking of? Billy Green. Brian Stewart. Edwards. Yeah. That was your name. No, I was thinking of the other Merrimack guy. Ronnie. Oh, Ronnie Anderson, yeah. Yeah, Ronnie Anderson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, that's good stuff. Yeah. You got anything else? No, that I just, I mean, this has been great. I mean, we could sit around the campfire for yeah, no. We got to leave? <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, well, Jenny Craig, Jenny, we pulled up at Jenny Craig. I thought it was another intervention for him. Oh, we got to give a shout out to our, uh, you know, uh, one of our favorite sponsors here, the Cross Country Mortgage Definitely. Studio. These guys, uh, Devo and the crew, did an unbelievable job of hosting us. And, we, you know, that was one of the big things is we wanted to sit around the yeah. campfire with you guys. We used, used to doing the Zooms and, or whatever it is over the internet, but. I know that technology probably isn't your guys' thing, right? Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> That's what a car does? Was it Zoom? <laughs> that was a show on Channel 2. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah, this has been a good hot stove. This is what we would always do, it, like, on the road. Like, you just sit around, you know, someone's hotel room and just chat, you know, come go a little hot stores. stove, you know. So we just want to thank you guys for taking the time to come oh, in. Thank you. Yeah, no, this is uh, truly a pleasure. This has been great, and obviously, you know, to my favorite guys. Yeah, we, uh, no, oh, we've been, you know, lucky around. Like you said, I think that's the one of the biggest things is the good people and the memories and the friendships, and, and I mean, that's what it's all about, right? That's what it's all about is creating those lifelong friends in the game of hockey, and that's what it's provided us, you know, and everything else college hockey, scholarships, NHL contracts. Podcasts, vodkas, beers, whatever it is, right? That's all. Uh, that's all bonus. Yeah, we need to get into like carrying your shirts on a hanger to the rink. Uh, yeah. Well, I think we know <laughs> your guys' philosophy <laughs> on all that stuff. <laughs> you know? you wouldn't have to guess on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you were an iron and uh, oh. the boy shirts. <laughs> Uh, and the wheelie bags. Uh, the wheelie uh, bags. Ah, uh, all these years of parking, we never invented that. <laughs> <laughs> we could be wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> Wheel bags. I, now, I saw do. another thing too that I would say it was like on the doorway of a locker room. It was basically just like a team's flag that's like a magnet that sticks on. I'm like, another stupid thing. Yeah. But like, you know, these these parents are gonna buy it. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like we couldn't have thought of something like that. Unbelievable. I was seem to be doing a pretty good. Yeah. On that door. yeah. Baby on board. I think your show is terrific, <laughs> by the way. Oh, really thank you. Appreciate it, dude. Yeah, you guys are doing a great job. Can't wait to come back for your 200. Yeah. We can talk about our road trips. Yeah, we, we're <laughs> going to go through the alphabet again. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Go <laughs> <laughs> backwards. Zali, Zali, we'll oh, 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 stay yeah. Zali <laughs> Zalapski is coming on for 101. Zali. Zali. <laughs> Number my 55. favorite name in hockey. Yeah. My favorite yeah. name. Yeah. Absolutely. I still got people in Germany believing... Um, Zali was lost. Actually, you guys got to tell that <laughs> story about, about the Pee Wee Quebec when you were, what was that bar in the, the Dorchester Tavern? Yeah. yeah. Tell I mean, that story about oh. the actors that you guys said you were. Oh, my God. No, he was Winchester Slim. Yeah. <laughs> and good, good pull uh, stick going that night. Jim Byrne was John Candy. <laughs> yep. I was. Uh, you was you were Wendell Clark. Wendell Clark. And he looked just like Wendell. him. Wendell. He did look just like him. I came name. back three years later, walked into the bar, the, the lady, the owner goes, Wendell! <laughs> <laughs> But what oh, was yeah. uh, what was the spitz we were with? Uh, Bobby the, Kennedy. Well, he was Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. Was Bobby <laughs> Brian. Cute little. Brian, yeah. Was it Brian? Brian. Brian. Right? Yeah, it was Brian Spitz. Yeah, Brian. Oh, oh, yeah. oh you weren't with Ben. Bill and David. And it was Ben's brother was up take, watching him because it's right, 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 right. And uh, he was he was a Kennedy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, know, I, know. Well, I remember leaving beers in the bathroom that night. They kept buying us beers, and they weren't. Like twelve ounce or even sixteen ounce. They were like thirty-two ounce. ounce. Uh, so that's like how we won in Quebec. The coaches were just completely buckled at all the games. <laughs> I was freaking bedwetters. Uh, <laughs> team game. Use the ball. Like the Use the ball. We, we were in that bar room for so long. They got like four feet of snow. Oh. We come out the cards and the and the patrons, the guys that we were buying beers from, and they shoveled us out. They cleaned the car off. That's a good shift. Yeah, oh, it was great. 
Then we were looking for some place. Well, the driver was came up the hill and someone did a 360 field. because of the snow. We came up the hill and oh, uh, yeah. whoever was driving, we were going to but maybe a judge now. Um, <laughs> and uh, we did like a 360 and we said, ah, I don't think we need food. Let's, let's, <laughs> yeah, let's go back to the hotel. Yeah, yeah. There's got to be some peanuts or something like that. <laughs> yeah. somewhere. We grab those. Oh, we got a bunch of loonies for the vending machine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. All right, well, uh, this has been great. Once again, thank you guys for coming in. Thank uh, you. We really thank appreciate you. it. And uh, we'll have to do it again sometime for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Love maybe, to. Hey, maybe when the big dig's done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, <laughs> Matz's garage. Yeah. Rome wasn't built in a day, but, oh, no. if we, but if it was, we would have hired their contractor. It's <laughs> <Mott's laughs> the same you know, sign up. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Another t-shirt. I saw it on the billboard once. <laughs> I probably messed it up too. No, no you nailed it. Nice. All right, that's a wrap then. See you later. <laughs> All right, thanks, thanks guys. Thanks.